Okay. Um, I promised you all last week I'd bring my own clicker, and I went home, and the little dongle that you need out of these things to stick in the computer, I had the clicker but no dongle, so I don't know where it was. So we're going to give a shot at this thing again and see what we can do. But we're going to look at Luke uh, chapter 19, and... Do I need to move that or it's no, okay? Um, did you get the handouts? Okay. The uh, the first one is is the uh, single sheet where it talks about the chiastic structure of Luke. I don't remember. I missed one or two times when um, Jonah was teaching, and so as a result, I don't know exactly if he ever mentioned this at all. Um, depending on what you're uh, looking for, what you're what, what you're trying to analyze in, in a particular book, that that chiastic structure will look differently. And it's much like um, I taught in English, and so there are times in the book that when we want to examine it, if I'm trying to teach certain literary concepts then we'll be real heavy in what those concepts are and how they're utilized. But <clears throat> other times, we're, we're looking at uh, the art of the story, uh, how it's put together, in other words. Some things are um, <clears throat> maybe chronological. Um, how else can, I'm gonna ask you that because it, it kind of can play into this. <clears throat> How else can um, time be discussed besides chronological? You find it in uh, the Bible. Would you find it in there's a time to what? So, so there's a time to read. Is that chronological? It's a time period, like an epoch, like an era, like a season. And so you can describe things in seasons. And <clears throat> so the time factor is not so much that we look at things chronologically, but in that case we look at them, is it, is it the season? Is it the time of discontent? Is it the time of disbelief? Is it the time of, does that make sense? And so some of the things that are gonna be alluded to here tonight actually <clears throat> are not so much, well, in March, this is gonna happen, and in next January, this is gonna, it's not gonna be a chronological thing. In fact, Jesus will be referring to some things that really are dealing with time structures that are a little bit different. <clears throat> and I say that because when you're putting together these chiastic structures, they don't all have to be, uh, if they're if they're meant to be, like I said, let's look at the, the uh, literary structure of it. It's gonna look one way. If we say we're gonna look at it um, because of uh, how the story, how this does Luke tie in with other books, Acts for instance, and, and how, then you're gonna look at it. Just glance at this next one, just to give you an idea. <clears throat> On these two sheets, first, we have a paracope literary structure. Do you know what a paracope is? We went through that, I think, or we will. Okay, you know paracope? Okay. <clears throat> a paracope <clears throat> is a term, in, <clears throat> it says on the thing there first, paracope literary structure. Um, I think it's the next slide.
Okay. On the paracoke structure, a, a paracoke is just a um, uh, an approach that takes one particular section of scripture, and really, paracope is a is a thing that's a primarily a, a religious biblical term. You're not going to see it in English studies and things like that. But it's where you pull one section of the scripture and let's study that. Let's create a, a chiastic structure for that particular thing and see how it's put together. And you can take all those different paracopes in the stories. And we're going to look at some of them. We're not going to do the whole chapter tonight, but um, there's several different parables that we're going to look at tonight. Sometimes a parable is paired, is paired with another parable to make one complete thought. And so if that's the case, what you're going to want to do is take those two sections, this parable and this parable, and put them together. That becomes a paracope. A section that you're going to pull together to make sense out of what, in this case, Jesus is saying in the parables. There'll be other times, other times where you'll have one section that's going to talk about maybe Jesus' interaction with the uh, scribes or the Pharisees and the interaction that goes there. And that particular paracope will tell us a lot about the religious, uh, <coughs> political, Kind of things that are happening and how Jesus relates to those world things rather than the spiritual things. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in the this paracope literary structure, if we look at <clears throat> 19, the, the whole chapter, you have <clears throat> one through four the verses are going to uh, compile one aspect of that that, air, that section then you have 1 5 through 25 um, and you have discussion about Elizabeth people waiting words of the angel words of Zechariah that doesn't sound right I think I was using that as an example. That's not chapter 19. If you look at it, that stuff is not 19. No, it's I chapter just one. Huh? Chapter okay. one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Chapter one, one through four. Yeah, chapter one, five. But I said up above it in Luke 19. And it's not Luke 19, it's Luke 1. Um, but see, they, in, in that particular chapter in one, you pull out those three different areas and you're going to analyze them to see how they work. You notice the first one is A, B, and then A, B, and then you have an A, B, C, D, and another A, B, C, D. Um, and you can go on for all the other passages in, in any particular chapter. Uh, <clears throat> the other and I'm just trying to get across the point that this is, I can tell you a, a particular uh, chiastic structure and you could go over to LCU and listen to another professor who's gonna say, oh, well, it's this way. And the difference is be not because either one of us is wrong, but what is it that we're trying to analyze, okay? Um, <clears throat> The large-scale chiasm that's down at the bottom is 19. But you notice it says Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And then we have a section where people are going to follow Jesus. Then you have that C section, how to inherit eternal life, uh, a discussion about prayer, and then the signs of the kingdom. And we can 
go on through each of the other areas that we want to. Um, <clears throat> this is looking at particular uh, sequences. Those sequences can change depending on what, who you are and what you're, what you're looking for out of the, out of the chapter. Um, <clears throat> this one, I kind of put it out there for you, the verses. Notice you have in Luke 19, 1 through 10, you have the A, the B, and the C. A is talking about, uh, in verse 2, a chief tax collector and also a wealthy man. And you have the, the Greek word for what he was. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was an arch tax collector. He was the one. And practically, in many cases, would get a cut out of what the other, like, you guys would just be tax collectors. And at the end of the day, you'd come to me and I'd get my cut of whatever you cheated them out of. So I got whatever I could get plus what you cheated them out of. I was trying to figure out how to say that. Um, <clears throat> then the next section really turns into you have uh, this guy a sinner and his name is Zacchaeus and Jesus says today I'm going to go to your house and so we look at that and again we have the ABC and then a CBA where those those things tie together and if you look at the C's in 21 and 22 um, <clears throat> I don't want to read this to you, I would guess, but uh, in 1921, um, he's taking what he didn't lay down and he's harvesting what he did not plant. That's the cheating thing. And then in 22, there's a turn. And he says, taking up what I do not lay down and harvesting what I did not plant. And by the way, that, that phrase was, Technically, are you in the vault? In other words, he was, he was talking about where, where people take their money. And, and it was a stealing concept. So, <clears throat> again, <clears throat> when you analyze that story, looking right below that, I have the A, the B, and the C. The people who don't want the man to be the king that's the three people. And these people represent other people. And uh, I don't want to get all English teacher on here, but um, in, in a lot of the stories, um, I can't think of a good story to use off, offhand. Um, I, I can imagine I told a story about a, a boys' school, and in that boys' school, uh, there was a, two rivers that converged, and there was a tree there, and nobody was allowed to get on that tree and play with it, or, you know, mess around on that tree. And there, was, <clears throat> there were two people who got up into that tree. Well, we could start off and say, okay, with the with two rivers converging, which is biblical, and the tree in that area, which is a nice place, and everybody wants to go there, would represent uh, Garden of Eden. <clears throat> One of the boys who's going to get onto the tree and who shouldn't have would be, represent Adam. Or Eve. Well, Eve is birth. Yeah, Adam, mostly. There's two boys, so I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> where we went down the other Eden. Um, but those kind of things and those those characters are, are making a statement that representative of uh, what's being told of that the people should recognize. And I won't go into the second thing, uh, the second page right now. 
we'll, we'll be talking about some of this stuff. And so let's see if we can go on a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the Do you like word uh, etymology? No, you don't know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Where's the word assassin come from? You know? Ooh. And you've heard of the Crusades. People from England and other places would go to the Holy Land and they would uh, go down there in search of the Holy Grail. Well, they went down there and they weren't wanted to begin with and they weren't very nice people, but even though they were on a Christian crusade, they weren't nice people. So, <clears throat> the people there um, <clears throat> would get high on hashish and in that altered state, they would tell the crusader, come here, let me show you something. And they'd take them up on the roof as an example, push them off, the crusader would die and <clears throat> Those people who did that high on hashish were called hashishans because they killed people. Mm -hmm. And when the crusaders were coming, they said, when you go down there, be careful of the hashishans, they're killers. Mm -hmm. And because we all know in England, they don't say their H's, yeah. it turned into assassins. Mm -hmm. yeah, little history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the word pericope actually comes from two Greek words that mean to cut out. And that's what we're doing when we look at a pericope. We're cutting that out and saying, let's just look at that. That one right there. <clears throat> Kelly knows all about that. The doctor said, we're going to cut out this part of you and we're going to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't need it anyway. Hmm? Yeah. That's it. You don't need this anyway, so we'll just take that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I try to treat you nice and you abuse me. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> There's a tendency sometimes when we, when we analyze these things, if if you want to look at, we can look at uh, Luke 9, 51 uh, through 10, 37. And in that, in that particular story, <clears throat> what we tend to ignore so much is the question that's asked in it. We're looking at the statements about the story. And <clears throat> um, I guess it's like anything else, uh, I know when I was teaching, kids would be in the classroom and um, they'd say, can I? And my little spidey sense would kick in and I'd say, I don't think you need to go to the bathroom right now. You know, because I could tell they wanted to do something else in the bathroom. So sometimes the question that's asked is more important than what it is that you're actually talking about or studying about. And in some of these cases, and I just threw us a few up there. Um, do you not care that I'm left to serve alone? You know, that tells you a little bit about uh, self-interest and, and uh, feeling put upon, and there's, you can read all that into it. Um, we were talking about, in all the years we were married, I was, we've been married 55 years, I don't know, 54, 54. And so, um, David said, did you ever, in all your years, leave your wife somewhere? And we said, he, he said, once, and I'll never do it again. And I said, never, because I knew better to begin with. I'll push my button some other way, but not that way. Well, um, I know with Nora, in my 55 years, I'd come home from work and I'd say, how are you? Fine. 
present. <laughs> that doesn't sound fine. Okay, now I gotta start asking some questions. And I have to be careful what the questions are that I ask and how I ask them. They can't be accusatory questions. Well, did you do that again? You know, <laughs> I don't want to do anything like that. So in the stories, and these are just some examples, um, will those who are saved be few? If you read behind that, it, it t tells you what's on their mind. When will the kingdom of God come? And we're going to see that uh, at least alluded to uh, later in, in this particular chapter. Because Jesus is going to tell them at the end of the chapter, Jerusalem will not be here. It's going to be torn down and every one of you are going to be destroyed. And he's warning them, but he wasn't that specific with it. So as you look through this chapter or any of the chapters that we're studying, sometimes instead of looking at, well, <clears throat> um, Jesus said, I'm going to go to your house, Zacchaeus. That, that story is good. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to come to your house. But the questions that are asked might be more important than the descriptions of what actually happened. So, <clears throat> sounds like I'm giving you a whole lot of stuff so far about this chiastic structure. Um, like on the next slide, In, in Luke chapter 17, that's the beginning, starting in 11, that's the beginning of a much larger section that's, that's put together. Now, <clears throat> prior to the Luke 17 is a, a separate section that all, all of that, in the sense of a paracope, the stuff prior to 17 fits together to make a, a story, to get a point across. 17 and then <clears throat> um, up to Luke 18 and 30 is uh, a, a balanced longer section and then <clears throat> Luke 18 31 through 44 is the second part of that longer section and so the, the thing is divided up into, into sections that when looked at individually and studied actually tell different things even though it's part of one whole story each one has a separate each section has a separate point um, well we're gonna as we look at we're gonna look at some of the scripture here and it's gonna it's gonna say that Jesus was on his way um, or, and we get the whole story is he's on his way to Jerusalem and toward the end of the chapter for instance um, they have uh, he has the um, disciples get a colt a, a donkey colt and he says go you'll find one and untie it and bring it and when the people say, why are you taking my colt? Just say, the master needs it. And that's all they said. And they walked off with it. And the, symbolically, that's the kind of thing that we've, we're told all the time in sermons, that um, him riding in on a colt, usually the king was brought in, usually on a horse, and it was a much bigger thing. But the, what did the people do when they were wheeling Jesus in on this colt? Not really walking in there. What do they do? They're lying down palm branches. They lay down palm branches. They're praising him because they thought he was going to be a king. King. Now we're going to go and look at that. The story of the three men with the money, and that that uh, owner who gave them the money, and the talents, and we have a different representation there of someone who's going to be. Um, looked at as a king. You, oh, what we got there? I don't know why it 
did that. So, um, in after the notice of Jesus moving towards Jerusalem, in in uh, in the beginning of this particular chapter, um, we're going to find two stories, and those stories are connected. And we can look at those right now. If you look at um, 1835 through 43. Sheet. You want me to read it? Sure. Okay. Uh, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked, What was happening? They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led, the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus praising God when all the people saw it they also praised God okay <clears throat> did you notice verse 35 how it starts out <clears throat> as Jesus came near the city of Jericho and <clears throat> he's traveling on his way to Jerusalem um, we have this that particular story um, go on down go to 19 one and we have another story now Jesus was going through the city of Jericho now throughout this these sections Jesus traveling him moving is one of the devices that Luke uses and it's and it's unique to Luke um, and he's He's going to try and develop this time period of this is what's happening when Jesus is going through this thing. And this is chapter 19 is leading up to him going to Jerusalem. And he uses that phrase to put all these stories in and that's, that's his transition phrase. Um, we're not going to look at that thing quite yet. In 18 verse 42 that you just read um, it says Okay. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to see. Jesus said to him, then see, you are healed because you are believed, because you have believed. And um, the words used there about his belief are sissokin see, and I'm sure I'm messing up the Greek on that. It's S-O-S-O-K-E-N, -S -S sissokin and then the next word is see. And those words translate as um, your faith. It's when he talks about his faith, it has saved you. Your faith has saved you. And in 19.9, we're going to see the same reference. Uh, and uh, it's going to say soteria there, which is a a uh, different form of the, uh, the idea of salvation and it that salvation is based on um, how you respond how people respond to and, and the Greek is very 
um, intimate. You know, we have so many words for love, and so uh, in the Greek, they they'll say one thing, and we we translate it as something else. And the translation from the old Greek to whatever the new. And I've tried this. I've looked up some of these words, uh, googling them, and the the current translation of it is like um, jump on a bus. I don't know. Something really weird, and it doesn't say anything about salvation. But if you go back and, and ask for the the uh, the etymology, there's that word history. But if you go back to the etymology of it. Uh, the original meaning of the words dealt with salvation and it was and salvation in a response to um, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here have you ever been offered a gift and you didn't take it like you did like I said please here take this you go no, 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 no. I don't I don't need a gift I don't. have you ever refused a gift I, I would hope you did sometime maybe yeah we do that and we do it as a sense of uh, humbleness humility you know like yeah I helped you out but no I don't need a gift because I do that kind of thing so um, when Jesus offers a gift like he does with um, Zacchaeus when he offers a gift, when he offers a gift to that blind man, the blind man appropriates it. He takes it, right? He says, I'm gonna make it mine. That gift is mine. You're gonna give me sight. Zacchaeus is offered in effect salvation. Jesus is in effect saying, I want you to believe in me. I want you to follow me. I want you to to be one of my disciples, not disciple like we think, follow him around. But <clears throat> we want him to appropriate that gift. And when they do, that um, is, is that idea of salvation. So the question I might ask you is, how do we explain that to somebody who's looking to get baptized? Do we really, I mean, I know with children, young children, lots of times, they see everybody else getting baptized and they say, well, I need to be baptized. And if you were to say, why? Explain to me what happens. Explain to me what you, are they gonna get it? I was 21 and then and people were, before I was 20, before I was baptized, not 21. I still, they were, there was two teachers, by the way, who took me through the um, Jewel Miller film strips, mm -hmm. if you've ever seen them. Uh, that's my only saving grace as a teacher. Whenever I think I'm boring these people to death, I know that it's not Jewel Miller. <laughs> so that I'm not that bad yet. If they tell me you were just like Jewel Miller, then it's time to quit. <laughs> if, but I had, there were questions I had, and I didn't, even then, you know, I didn't know all the answers. I, I didn't even begin to understand things like salvation and grace and all those terms. And so now it's time for us to look at some of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> if you will, I talked to him. Nice visuals. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. When the elders come, you would say we really need better equipment in the education department. Uh, yes. And we're going to spend the money. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that when he brought that up, <laughs> that was a blast from the past. Right? Now, if you can remember Jewel Miller, you're, you're telling don't, me don't, something about your Don't age. say it. <laughs> don't say that you're old. Okay. <laughs> okay. Try this again. Okay. Um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the same story is told about the three, about the blind man. Um, and there's one about, it's called Blind Bartimaeus. And there's a difference in the names or the use of the name and everything, but they're, they're paradigms of what um, they're, they're the definitions of what salvation is talking about and the, the conversion that everybody goes through. These guys, <coughs> the blind people, <coughs> had a different experience after what they had with Jesus. What they were experiencing here was one that Jesus comes into the scene and talks to them. They have a different view, a whole different world view of what's happening to them. Um, <clears throat> if I took Kelly to the doctor and said, uh, you had what 16 stints? I don't, I don't know how many you had. Nine, eight, six. You don't remember? Oh, sorry. You had a lot of stints. Okay. So <laughs> you may hold the record. Not sure. <clears throat> if the doctor came and said, I'm going to make you better, but I'm going to have to operate on you. That's one that you come out and you're grateful. Because otherwise, if you didn't fix it, you could be in really bad condition. But if Jesus comes along and says, do you think that I can do this? What do you want from me? I just want to see. Okay. See. He's going to have a different uh, mindset. He's going to have a different perspective after that. And these stories are all common about that. Um, the the crucial um, difference in the way Luke records it is um, he glorified God afterward. That's what's kind of about that difference then. I mean, he went off glorifying God because it had to be a God thing. It couldn't have been magic or any other chicanery of any kind. And so he felt good about that. Um, I'm, I'm just going to read this to you. Chapter 7, verse 16. The human response to the healing and to conversion is vertical. That is, praise to God. The meaning of physical, the meaning of a physical need led to a spiritual conversion and produced an outpouring of praise. This is one paradigm of conversion then and now. Um, the key word there is vertical. <clears throat> If I'm sitting with any one of you, if Dave and I go out to lunch and, and we have some sort of a, a bonding moment that we didn't have before, that's a vertical thing. If, if I'm trying to convince David that uh, people from the Philadelphia area, Yankees, are the best people in the world, and when I'm done talking to him, he says, yes, they are. I believe. Because they're Yankees. We are. I promise. No. <clears throat> That's a vertical conversion. If I get him to believe, I can I'd say that about my father-in-law. He, hate, he hated everything about me until 
he realized that I was taking his daughter to church and I became an elder. And then he went, you're okay. Because I was, no, I was living in Texas. I was no longer, I said y'all. It was a vertical conversion. He, he converted to, to me. And we had that horizontal conversion. A vertical conversion is what we're talking about here with these all the stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all going to deal with that. Um, with that kind of horizontal conversion. I'm getting lucky. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I need to pray harder before we come to class. Maybe come here and practice with that. Um, I still believe I need a different one. Um, <clears throat> the second paradigm about these stories that, that are in this chapter are that uh, it's a conflict story. Um, in verses 1 through 6, when we're looking at uh, Zacchaeus, uh, Jesus acts, and then in verse 7, he meets with criticism, and then in verses 9 through 10, he responds. And it's, it's a conflict thing. And, and Luke's setting up that conflict um, to make a point at the, end of the, at the end of the chapter. But let's look at that one, one, through, one through 10. We'll look at that story. It says Jesus was going through the city of Jericho again, starting off with that traveling thing. A man was there named Zacchaeus. By the way, you know what Zacchaeus means? Pure. And it's talking about somebody who's um, pure and perfect. Was he? Obviously not. Okay. <clears throat> and it says he was a very important tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because he was too short to see above the crowd. Does that sound like, I want to see Jesus because I believe in everything he's saying? He just wanted to say, here comes this itinerant uh, prophet, and he's coming through as a teacher, and I want to see who he is and what he's like. So he ran ahead to a place where Jesus would come, and he climbed a sycamore tree so he could see him. Uh, When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, and this is the story we always get. How did he know his name? You know, that kind of thing. Hurry and come down. I must stay at your house today. Remember, he was traveling through on his way somewhere. Why would he suddenly stop and say, I have to spend time with you today? Normally, he's just walking on through. He's on his way to the... Jerusalem. So Zacchaeus came down quickly and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to complain. Jesus is staying with a sinner. <clears throat> but Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, I will give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will pay back four times more. And you can do a study into uh, the whole idea. Go back to the Old Testament and look at the requirements of if you cheat somebody what you're supposed to give to them and four and five times more is, uh, is is fair according to religiously and Jesus said to him salvation has come to this house today because this man also belongs to the family of Abraham the son of man came to find lost people and save them and so his, his response to their criticism is, I'm coming, 
there's an interaction, people complain, and I'm going to respond to you. Now, it doesn't say anything there about the people agreeing or what they said or anything else. He's giving them the response. It's up to them to come to a conclusion about what they just witnessed. But notice, <clears throat> it says, as the people were listening to this, Jesus told them a story because he was near Jerusalem and they thought God's kingdom would appear immediately. He was on his way to Jerusalem to do what? <laughs> to die. But they thought he was on his way to Jerusalem to become that, that king. And he said, a very important man went to a country far away to be made a king and then to return home. Now again, we have this king imagery that's being brought up by Luke. And to, uh, I guess, ultimately um, pound home this idea that he's a king, but he's not a king like we are expecting. So he called 10 of his servants and gave a coin to each servant. He said, do business with this money until I get back. <clears throat> but the people in the kingdom hated the man. So they sent a group to follow him and say, we don't want this man to be our king. Any of this starting to sound, based on your story of Jesus, sound, you know, familiar? They didn't, they didn't want him to be the king. They wanted him to be not king of their lives, but king. They wanted him to be a different kind of king. But the man became king. When he returned home, he said, call those servants who owe my money so I can know how much they earned with it. The first servant came and said, um, sir, I earned ten, 10 coins for the one you gave me. The king said to the servant, excellent, you're a good servant. Since I can trust you with small things, I will let you rule over 10 of my cities. Second had five, and he can rule over five cities. Then another servant came in and said to the king, Here is your coin, which I wrapped in a piece of cloth and hid. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You even take money that you didn't earn and gather food that you didn't plant. Then the king said to the servant, I will condemn you by your own words, you evil servant. You knew that I am a hard man, taking money that I didn't earn and gathering food that I didn't plant. Why then didn't you put my money in the bank? Then when I came back, my money would have earned some interest. The king said to the men who were standing by, take the coin away from the servant and give it to the servant who earned 10 coins. And they said, but sir, that servant already has 10 coins. And the king said, those who have will be given more, but those who do not have anything will have everything taken away from them. Now, where are my enemies who didn't want me to be king? Bring them here and kill them before me. That whole story, as you read it, obviously, has a lot to do with what's being told to us today, but to those people at the time, about how they're supposed to respond as a member of the kingdom. Now, that should make us think a little bit, I guess. What have we done with the coins that we were given? What do you have? And what, what did you do with it? What do you use it for um, the <clears throat> when Jesus responds <sighs> just take him in question when he responds um, it has a lot of similarities to the other things in all the stories um, you're going to have this idea of him traveling and him uh, encountering somebody they're going to um, have a problem with it and he's going to um, as they criticize him he's going to tell them the, the end result um, again I'm English teacher person isn't it ironic that Zacchaeus whose name meant pure wasn't until he had a relationship with Jesus and then technically became pure. His salvation did come to him. Um, I know we're running out of time. I had a lot of scripture to go over. I 
gonna, I'll say this. Getting assurance of the reality of what has transpired in the secret of the human soul, this assurance rests on two things, a transformed life and the witness of Jesus. Now, I don't, again, when you're a child and you, and you get baptized, you may not be cognizant of what happens to you. Have you seen people who, who are older, maybe, who get baptized and they come out almost transformed. They're on fire. They now realize there, there's a realization within them that something almost magical has happened to them. And they're, they're more aware of it. Younger people don't get that. Older people do. Um, I, I know the bell's gonna ring and you gotta go get your kids. We had, <clears throat> I can tell you many stories of people who are much older who realize they're getting bad, uh, going to die. Um, he's not here now. One of our ex-ministers went with me, and we baptized a man at the church who was on life support, and with all the wires and everything, he said, I don't care. I want to be baptized. And <clears throat> I hope I don't have a problem in the afterlife with this, we did not dunk him because of all those wires. He would have electrocuted him. Uh, but we did make sure that he had as much water on him as possible. I mean, we, were, we didn't want anybody saying, well, we don't sprinkle. Well, that was as close as I could get. So I want you to know, for somebody who's getting ready to die, his heartbeat and everything else went up. It wasn't because of the electricity. He was happy. He realized he needed that. And that's an experience I'll always remember. I'm sorry we didn't get to go through all of it. Would you mind if I picked up some of it next week? Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I hope that clock's right. It is. It's eight yeah. o'clock. I kept you too long. Uh, <clears throat> sorry I got too much English teachery in me.